Okay, uh, thanks very much for joining us. If you're watching this live uh, or if you're going to be watching the recording, uh, we really appreciate you giving up the time and we really, really appreciate um, Simon's time and uh, his commitment to, um, to his work. We met Simon very early on in our MyMove journey. He was a very early adopter of MyMove, but more importantly for the, well, I don't know if it is more importantly, but I think it's probably all connected, but for the purpose of this session, Simon uh, leads uh, PE, having returned to PE from senior management uh, in schools, admin in schools, um, he returned to PE and he uh, he's probably been far too bashful to say, but um, he, he does some wonderful work with inclusive PE and in particular um, with inclusion of uh, young people from his LGBTQ plus community. Um, so thank you very much, Simon. And I'm now going to put myself on mute and enjoy your presentation. Thanks, Greg. I'm not on mute, am I? No. All right. Two years into this pandemic, I finally got the uh, hang of not being on mute. So thanks for those, uh, like Greg has said, uh, for joining us. And thanks for those that are watching um, retrospectively. Um, if at any point you, I've got the, the chat box up in the corner. Uh, Greg, can you just nod or thumbs up? Can you see the chat box I've got up on my screen or can you just see my slides? That's fine, okay. Because um, it is obscuring some of the slides. So if you want to ask any questions, uh, throw it into the chat. Um, Greg, if, you, if I don't see anything that you think is relevant, um, uh, just interrupt me at any point and we can talk. Um, I have quite a lot of content for you to listen to in the first instance and then the sort of second half will be more um, discussion based um, if you want to contribute to the discussions otherwise myself will, and Greg I'm sure will be just chew the fat and, and talk around some issues so um, as you can see the, the title of the uh, presentation supporting transgender and gender diverse young people in physical education my name is Simon Scarborough and my pronouns he him uh, head of physical education at Crispin School, which I've just popped in the, the chat there, is a stone's throw away from the Glastonbury Festival site, which may or may not um, be well known around the globe. And our, our visitors, uh, guests from overseas. Okay, so aims of today's session, uh, we're going to look at developing our knowledge and understanding of the LGBTQ plus uh, community. Um, particularly with a focus on um, the T, the trans uh, gender, having a look at the life through the lens um, of someone who identifies as trans in um, in school in general, but um, specifically in physical education, and what strategies we can implement to support those young people. Um, and we may not come up with many strategies today. We may look at um, the challenges, possible solutions, and, and maybe the barriers and we've got a follow-up session next week where we can um, follow up on any, any issues that we've um, covered today or haven't got time to cover today. Um, <clears throat> before anyone makes any sort of contribution, I won't make any reference to any individuals uh, and individual names, although I'll talk about young people. Um, and if you want to come on and share experiences, obviously you will um, just keep those anonymous, even though we are in, in different parts of the globe. Okay, so um, a lot of P departments, if not all of the P departments that I know will have um, a vision or an aim, um, which kind of like incorporate an ethos of their department. Uh, this is our one that we have at Crispin School um, to promote well-being, lifelong physical activity and excellence for all in PE. Uh, I'm starting to actually, on, on a side from the content today, I'm reviewing the excellence for all in PE following a a podcast that was actually commented on by Greg on, on Twitter about whether we do actually need excellence for every student in P and what excellence might look like. Um, and that's a, a legacy from my pre predecessor as head of P where it's very much um, sort of sport-based curriculum and uh, the, the focus is on sports performance and fixtures. And I felt like that excluded a lot of, of students. Um, and we talk a little bit about extracurricular activities in the LGBT community as well. Um, but certainly, I think, got the order right there, the, the promoting well-being, the lifelong physical activity. Um, and research does show that um, 
the mental health, physical and mental health um, of young people that identify as LGBT um, can be significantly impacted um, negatively and also their the impact on being able to access physical activity and sport in particular. Um, so we've got a really important job there. Um, and, and all departments, I'm sure, will say that you know, we, we want to be inclusive and we want to incorporate, promote a, a curriculum that's accessible for every child. Um, but whether that's actually true or not, uh, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper as to, as to whether that will be the case for uh, students that identify as LGBT. So I live um, in southwest of England and um, I live in a council area called Bath and North East Somerset. And uh, I have done some training with them because I'm a, a volunteer um, at a, a charity called Off the Record. Uh, which support young people's mental health and they have um, specialists in supporting uh, children at LGBT and I've become a, a volunteer myself and my wife and we volunteer once a month with them and we do various other bits and pieces and uh, I did some training with them and they've agreed that I can share the, the training I've had with them uh, with you here today um, so I'm going to um, talk a bit about that. If at any point you want to come in and say anything, I'm conscious we've got people uh, from outside the UK, you may have different terms, and this is part of the, the complexity of um, the LGBT community is that the language that is used, um, that isn't used, that is sometimes used, that was used, that might be used, um, and sometimes there's a, a fear or an anxiety about getting those that, that language wrong. So, um, so here we go. So um, gender identity is our, let's have to move some bits around the screen, apologies. Okay. So is our own internal and individual experience of gender. It is the sense of being a woman, a man, both, neither, or anywhere along the gender spectrum. A person's gender identity may be the same as or different from the sex they were given at birth. Okay, so um, sex is assigned at birth and refers to a person's biological status as either male or female. It is associated mainly with physical attributes such as chromosomes, hormones, and external and internal anatomy. Gender refers to socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that, that a given society considers appropriate for males and females or females. These socially developed views influence the way that people act, interact, and feel about themselves. So what does transgender mean? The word transgender describes a person whose gender identity, gender expression, or behavior does not conform to that typically associated with the sex they were given at birth. There are quite a few words to describe being trans. Transgender or trans people may be anyone who defines themselves as transsexual, has an intersex condition, defines themselves as gender dysphoric, and feels that they, they do not fit into the gender that society expects of them. And we'll come into a couple of those, um, go into a bit more detail, look at those um, key terms there. Um, I found this really interesting because um, before I did this training, I felt that if you were trans, it, it had to, it meant that um, you have made that decision to um, identify as the gender that was opposite to the sex you were assigned at, at birth. Whereas this definition is much more broad um, and anyone that doesn't feel like they fit into what society expects of them as being a boy or a girl, a man or woman, um, comes under the, the trans umbrella. And I think that's important because um, we, you may have a number of students at, at your school that are identified as trans, but you may have quite a, a number of students that are questioning their gender identity, um, but haven't actually expressed that um, to anybody uh, outside, maybe their family or friends or school. Um, and I think there'll be a lot more students that are, are feeling that way than, than we may expect. So um, I think it's really important. And, and the more that society sees people in the public domain that are um, a non-binary or gender question or, or, or trans, um, the more young people feel safe to, to maybe explore and maybe to, to talk to others about it. 
Um, so it being at the forefront of our, our minds is, um, I think, really important. Um, so what does gender dysphoria mean? Gender dysphoria is a condition where a person experiences discomfort or distress because there is a mismatch between their biological sex <coughs> and gender identity. <clears throat> me. Many transgender people are described as having gender dysphoria. So that sort of confusion about um, their identity and this discomfort or distress, um, often that can be like a mental distress. Um, and, and as children grow older, and particularly when they hit puberty, is quite a lot of complexities around the, the changing body um, and, and not necessarily, well, depending on how, how strongly they feel, um, some, some may not like their bodies and the changes that they are happening through puberty, they, they won't want to, to be happening, um, which adds another layer of complexity. But and I think when we come on to inevitably to ch changing rooms, um, that awareness around one's own body um, and body confidence um, is something we, we need to be really um, aware of and sensitive about. Um, trans can also be used as an umbrella term to describe anyone who dresses, behaves, or presents themselves in a way that is different from the gender norm. It includes, but is not limited to, people who identify as transgender, uh, trans women, which would be male to female, uh, or trans girl, trans men, female to male, transsexual, gender non-conforming, gender variant, or gender queer. So as I said before about the language, there's, there's a lot of, of language, key terms that, that um, can be used. Um, as you can see, there are lots of names, lots of labels. If someone tells you they are trans, just accept it as you would any other piece of information about them. Binary and non-binary gender. <clears throat> Binary simply means two, as traditionally gender has been described as either male or female. However, many people do not feel that they belong wholly to one gender or another. So if someone describes themselves as non-binary, it means they don't identify completely with either male or female labels. They may not like to be called by male or female pronouns, such as he and she, and prefer a more neutral pronoun, such as her, ze, they, or any other words that they feel comfortable with. Um, I think for those that aren't comfortable with he or she, I think they, them are, certainly for me, um, and in my experience as young people, is the most sort of, um, most common pronoun that's used for, for students that are, are non-binary. If you're worried about how to refer to someone who says they're non-binary, just ask them. There's something that I just I'll put in at this point about um, the, the government, my experience of, of the DfE, Department of Education in the UK, uh, and their guidance to schools, um, they're not quite sure <laughs> how best to support trans students at the moment. Um, the guidance is a little bit difficult to interpret or, or lacking. Um, we have a, a, had a policy where if a child wants to change their pronouns or their preferred name, uh, that could happen without the um, consent of parents. That's now changed, so parents have to have that consent, but that then creates some potential problems where if a child is out at school but not at home, for whatever reason, but that could be a a safeguarding concern if they if they um, come out to parents and they're worried about the reaction that one or both parents might have if they have two parents um, they may not want to come out at home and therefore there's a problem then with changing their pronouns and preferred name in school um, so you may want to double check with your senior leaders and head teacher around um, what the policy is on um, changing of pronouns at, at school um, and what, whether that's changed on the school records, on registers, um, because that can have quite a significant impact as well. If a, if a child has changed their preferred name uh, and changed their pronouns, um, if it's not been changed in the school system and it has to be done by memory um, from a teacher, if a um, supply teacher comes in or a teacher that doesn't know that child and reads out the name on the register, um, that can be a really traumatic experience for that for that young person. Particularly if, if it's secondary school, they've just started secondary school and, and other students don't know um, any history there, they just know that person as their preferred name, and then all of a sudden they're starting to be called a, um, a, a different name. <clears throat> Moving on, several key terms and definitions that relate to trans awareness. 
uh, intersex, around one in a hundred people are born with biological differences that do not fit neatly into male or female definitions. Uh, these differences are not always noticed at birth. In the past, the word um, hermaphrodite was used to describe people with characteristics that are both male and female. Intersex is the correct term. The term her hermaphrodite is considered offensive. An intersex person may look female on the outside, but have mostly male organs on the inside, or they may have sex chromosomes that are different from their defined sex. Gender fluidity refers to a gender identity which varies over time. A gender fluid person may at any time identify as male, female, or some intermediate combination. This allows for a more flexible range of gender expression which may change from day to day. Gender fluid people do not feel confined by restrictive boundaries of stereotypical expectations of women and men. On some days, the person may feel more female than male or vice versa. And gender queer is also a term non-binary. It's another term that represents a blurring of the lines surrounding society's rigid views of both gender identity and sexual orientation. Gender queer people embrace a fluidity of gender expression that is not limiting. They may not identify as male or female, but it's both, neither, or as a combination. And I think it's really positive and powerful that there are more and more people in the public domain um, that are gender queer and non-binary um, and really confident and happy um, being out there in, in the public domain, being a really positive role model for, or for young people. Um, the importance of self-expression. Gender expression be a combination of masculine, feminine, and, and androgynous traits. Androgyny, androgyny sorry, is the combination of masculine and feminine characteristics. Each of us expresses a particular gender in the way we style our hair, the clothes we wear, or even the way in which we walk or talk. Uh, so, sorry, sit or walk. Some traits are innate, meaning we were born with them, or the natural way that a person acts, speaks, or behaves. Gender expression is a means of stating one's gender identity. The fundamental way to express your gender is through your name or the pronoun you apply to yourself. However, uh, trans people frequently experience discrimination, harassment, and even violence because their gender identity or gender expression is different from their birth assigned sex. And I think that's particularly prevalent in places where um, trans people are kind of few and far between, and there's, you know, it's maybe new to, to um, a particular community. Um, so you may have areas of the country that have quite high levels of, um, high, relatively high, which isn't very high at all, um, numbers of tr trans people. Um, I live in part of the UK where I think we've got quite a high number of um, openly trans people, both young people and older people. Um, and as such, the students at our school um, in the main kind of shrug the shoulders and, and carry on. It's not, not an issue, not a problem. Um, and it's just accepted as, as part of life. Um, in other schools where there's fewer or no um, students that are identifying as trans, then that, that can lead to, um, I think, a, an increase in harassment um, where, where student, maybe young people don't know how to manage the fact that someone's presenting or was uh, identifying as uh, one gender and has, and has now changed. Um, and from a young age, many trans children experience comments like, stop acting like a girl, the way you talk, run, act is really effeminate, you're such a, um, you're so butch or bloke or unfeminine, uh, boys don't play with dolls, girls can't play football, um, and there's some fascinating uh, videos on YouTube that I've played in a um, PSHE lesson, personal social health education, um, around a child being dressed in different clothing and then being given to someone to look after for 10 minutes and the types of toys that they pick up. Um, it, incredible how it seems to be hardwired into human beings to treat and expect certain things from men and from women, boys and from girls. Uh, all these types of comments create a sense of shame in a trans child. It tells them that there is something wrong and unacceptable about the way they are. This can lead to severe depression and other mental health problems. And I think we've got to be really careful as in the P profession um, to not slip into gender stereotypes around what particular sports or activities we offer to particular students um, and the way we talk and um, to not reinforce those stereotypes. Um, because if someone 
is questioning their identity um, and they are made to feel shameful about how they're feeling and not liking a particular sport if they are identifying as boy or girl or, or non-binary um, we could inadvertently be having quite a, a large sort of significant impact on that person's mental health so we're nearly there before we, we start to have a think about um, the life from the perspective of a young trans person. Um, Realising that you're trans can cause significant feelings of isolation, having to hide true feelings, having to keep secrets from loved ones and family members, um, and all those can lead to depression and anxiety. Trans adults are much more likely to have had suicidal thoughts. 48% of trans adults report they have thought about taking their life at some point in their lives. So that's one in two, and that so that'll be one in two of the, the students that you're teaching today. Um, by the time they become adults, statistically half of them all would have considered taking their lives, which is um, a pretty bleak statistic. Uh, when trans people become aware of the condition, it may cause feelings of confusion, emotional conflict, isolation, and fear of rejection can lead to depression, anxiety, self-harm, and substance misuse. And this is why it's really important that, that P departments and schools, um, but P departments, in my opinion, need to be um, very overt and open allies to the LGBT community so that they know it's, it's a safe place for them to be. Um, and there's no shame in, in identifying as LGBT um, and that we're here to, to listen and to help and to support them. Um, we all have the right to live our lives as free from dis discrimination and abuse, but for trans people, discrimination and abuse is still very real. Transphobia is the fear, hatred or mistrust of people who are trans or whose gender expression does not conform to traditional gender roles. Trans transphobia causes people to feel to be unsafe and face discrimination. Uh, it can come in many different forms, including expressing negative attitudes and beliefs an aversion to and prejudice against transgender people, an irrational fear and misunderstanding about someone who is trans. I think that's quite an important one in young people in schools. Um, deliberately using the wrong pronouns or gender when addressing or referring to a trans person, derogatory language and name calling and bullying, abuse or violence towards a trans person. Um, this research came from the National Center of Transgender Equality in the United States. 90% of trans people reported harassment or discrimination at work. 19% reported being refused housing uh, because of their gender identity. 53% reported harassment in public and 19% reported being refused healthcare. Rates of unemployment for transgender people were twice that of the general population. Uh, and this, uh, don't use ignorance as an excuse. And this is, I guess, why you're here trying to learn more about um, the LGBT community, the, the trans community, um, so that we can better educate ourselves to better support young people that identify as trans. Uh, discrimination against trans people is the same as any other form of discrimination, such as racism or sexism. It can be subtle or blatant. People may be transphobic because they were raised to believe negative ideas about trans people, for example, due to strict beliefs or religious teachings. And some people may inadvertently be discriminatory due to lack of information or understanding about trans identity. And here you are. And actually, when I presented this at the Association of PE conference, where um, Greg had attended as well, uh, we actually had a teacher um, that taught at a, a Catholic school. And it was really interesting. He was really open to um, supporting um, trans students, but there was a, a conflict between the beliefs um, of the, the, the school values and ethos and, and the religion. Um, and what the, the guy was trying to do day by day to support the, the students there. So um, they had some really good conversations about that. And I was really encouraged to see how uh, he was trying to engage with um, with supporting young people that identify as LGBT. Um, very quickly, uh, violence against trans people. Um, hate crimes, so trans people are subjected to assaults, verbal abuse and harassment. These hate crimes are driven by transphobia. At least 80% of these crimes never come to the attention of the authorities. Those at greatest risk of harm are trans women, so men to women, and trans people from black, minority, and ethnic communities. Uh, like everyone else, trans people have the right to expect that their needs are met by public services. This is not always the case, even though the Equality Act 2010 states that discrimination on the basis of gender identity is officially recognised as unacceptable. 
The Equality Act 2010 states that trans people must not be discriminated against because they have a gender identity which differs from their gender assigned to them at birth. To be protected by the Act, the person does not need to have undergone any specific treatment or surgery to change them from their birth sex to their preferred gender. They can be at any stage in the transition process from proposing to reassign their gender to undergoing surgery and having completed the process. And the Gender Recog Recognition Act 2004 permits gender, transgender people to change their gender legally. Um, this will all be UK law. Uh, this means that they can obtain a new birth certificate and gives them full recognition of their acquired sex and law for all purposes, including marriage. Currently, this act only applies to adults. Children cannot legally accept the rights afforded by the act until they turn 18. However, some trans people feel that the assessment required to acquire GIA is intrusive and demeaning. So if I just quickly jump back to the Equality Act, those in the UK will know about the um, Special Educational Needs Code of Practice, um, and that refers to the Equality Act and that children can't be, people can't be discriminated against because of a disability. Um, and the concept of reasonable adjustments is very well established in UK schools um, and to support children with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, there is a, a legal duty by schools um, set out statutory requirements set out in the code of practice um, that schools need to meet in order to support children with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, there is no such statutory guidance at the moment explicitly around trans students. However, um, as transgender is one of the um, protected characteristics, um, they can't be discriminated against. So if a child does identify uh, with a gender that was different to their assigned birth, um, the school needs to cater and accommodate for that. Okay, so that's a lot of talking. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, I'm just going to have a, a chat with Greg. Greg, everything okay for now? Ready to move on? Yep, lovely job. Um, so here we go, life through the lens. Um, walk a mile in my shoes, see what I see, feel what I feel, then maybe you'll understand why I do what I do. Until then, don't judge me. And I think that's really important to, for us to try to, um, if you're not already, put yourself in a position of a young person that is um, transgender or or even just questioning, um, doesn't feel like they fit in, all of the stuff that we've just talked about, um, plus all the other pressures on, on life when you're, you're young. Uh, whether it be at primary school or secondary school. Um, so P lessons specifically. So we'll, we'll, we'll narrow it down to just P lessons rather than life. Um, what triggers are there? Um, what, ang what might they sort of trigger anxieties or, or worry um, for trans students or gender diverse students? when they approach a physical education lesson. If you wanna pop stuff in the chat, if you wanna pop off Zoom, it's quite a small group, Greg, so you're happy with people just to unmute and, and chat? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like just to get the, the ball rolling, and I, I'm not sure if this is as prominent in the US, but Jessica or uh, Aaron can set us right, but um, it's pretty common in the UK that PE is gendered by grouping and often by curriculum as well, so that there is girls PE, boys PE. It's not uncommon to have a team member who has responsibility for girls and or, or boys PE. Um, so gender identity is absolutely intertwined with the way that the, the subject is structured in a, in a lot of schools. Um, so um, I, uh, from with that slide in mind, you know, how does how does a, a young person who identifies as trans um, navigate the space when they go to a particular curriculum area in the school and it's girls over here and boys over there? Uh, and that um, that can I would imagine be very very uh, daunting and unnerving. Anyone else? Yeah, oh, sorry, I don't have my mic or my, there I am. Um, 
we don't and just me to jump in I, I don't know that we have as much um gendered pe it used to be it was always the case but i'm trying to think i know i'm trying to think if i've ever in recent years been where they've had it gendered um i know there's been lots of research on it and you know one of the, you know will they engage are they more apt to be involved in those types of things but when you come to these types of decisions as greg just mentioned i wonder if those are um, even if there were benefits to having it gendered for some other reason, if that's really worth the, and I, I don't think I, I'm trying to think if I've ever worked with a teacher that had like all girls or all boys. So maybe we're getting away from it. I don't, I, I, again, I know it was a hot topic about 20 years ago with all the research that was done on it and whether you should have gendered or not. And I used to get asked about it a lot, but I don't get asked about it as much anymore. So Aaron, can I ask, thanks for that, um, your class, are you currently at school, working in school at the moment? No, I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky, and I prepare physical education teachers. So I um, spend lots of times in schools, and, and but I haven't taught okay. in 20 years. So the schools that you work with, mainly they're, they're mixed classes, are they, in terms of gender? Yeah, I... Yeah, I'm just trying to think of the high schools we go to. I was just at one yesterday. My daughter goes to one. Yeah, I don't think any of them are gendered. I don't That's think nice. they have. I think it's boys and girls. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it fair to say that? Because I, I think that's more the case in Europe as well. Um, um, but is it fair to say that school athletics um, remains gendered? Uh, as it does, I think, internationally, school, youth and senior sport is, is very gendered. And I, I know in the US, there's probably, uh, I think it's fair to say, a slightly greater divide in the personnel who are coaching uh, in the athletics departments um, and those who are teaching PE. But that, that is a gendered manifestation that would come under the umbrella, I guess, of, of our work. Yes. Yeah. Every, I'll, I'll make, I think this is an interesting, I, I don't know why this is. I think we have bass fishing and that is not, I don't think. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. But Simon, am I right? In saying, am I right in saying that for some activities at your school, you will open the groups for or define the groups if it is gendered by those who identify as girl those who identify as boy do you do you go there with those structures to reduce the rigidity of gender categories so we've i started working here in 2018 seems like a lifetime ago um and there was a boys curriculum and a girls curriculum um and it followed broadly the traditional activities that boys and girls would take part in in, in p lessons and in inter-school competition so at the start of, in september the boys would be mainly playing rugby um, and the girls would be mainly playing hockey and fixtures, school fixtures would represent that as well. So we'd take all the boys' teams to go and play rugby fixtures and the girls would, would play hockey. Um, the main sports in after Christmas would be football for the boys and netball for the girls. And in the summer term, it would be rounders for the girls, uh, cricket for the boys, with athletics being accessed by, by both. Um, and we gradually phased out that um, now post COVID, or sort of during COVID, it was just before COVID, it was, it was changing. It's fully changed now. So um, every child has the same opportunities and same experiences um, at QC3, which is the first three years of secondary school. Um, and they start off in mixed groups. So at the moment we have mixed groups in year seven um, mixed gender, mixed ability. I've not set um, any P classes by physical ability um, in the last 15 years. Um, something I decided quite early on in my, my career that um, streaming students on their perceived physical ability from the teacher at such a young age and the impact that can have on someone's perception of their ability to be physically literate and um, physically active and the, the impact that has on the, the rest of their life is quite profound I think 
Um, you can speak to adults that have been put in bottom set PE uh, that still aren't that physically active or are trying to be physically active but have low self-confidence in, in that setting. So, um, and, and I think it's important that we're able to teach students of all abilities and all experiences in, in, within a single classroom. Um, so, so it doesn't matter when you come to Crispin, it doesn't matter how you, what you identify as, you all get the same experience as, as anybody else in, in that school. Um, and where we have sports clubs that have been traditionally dominated by one gender or another, um, it, all, all clubs are open to all students. Um, so we have a handball club that we have boys and girls attend, they train together. Um, when we play, we sometimes, well, we played a, an under-16s match tournament uh, a couple of weeks ago against some other local schools. Um, and we had boys and girls playing with that. So we, we just picked them by ability. Um, and there were boys and girls in, in that same group. Um, but we also have all boys teams. We have all girls teams as well. Um, and, and the same, so, it, go on. So a question. Um, so... I fully agree with the sort of that ideology behind the sets. Um, something that I've tried to implement um, as a new hod. So we've removed sets. But the question I was going to ask you, um, where you've just said boys and girls play together, mm. um, but then where where do where do transgender play then? Um, where where's their kind of? Because you said there's a boys group, there's a girls group, there's boys and girls groups who compete, and then where does transgender go? Where do they get to compete? Uh, they can, they, in my view, they can compete wherever they want to compete. Um, so when we had boys and girls classes a few years back um, and a student um, who I wasn't familiar with, I was actually taking a cover lesson um, and it was a girls group and they came up to me, took a huge deep breath and said, sir, my preferred name is this my pronouns, he, him, is there any chance I could go to the boys group? And without hesitation, I said, yes. Uh, knowing that it would be fine with the, the students in that group, um, that student then went to that other class and was much happier. Um, and, and I've also, so in terms of extracurricular sport, um, it's not that straightforward because if you're competing in a, in a tournament with other schools, um, and there's an expectation that only one gender can play, i.e. it's a boys team or a girls team. Um, I took a girls team over to a local school a couple of years ago before the pandemic, um, and there was a trans girl playing. It was in year seven, so they were 12 years old, and I had no problems with that child playing in that, in that team. Um, so if they identify as, as female, they play alongside other girls, if I identify as male, they can play alongside other boys. Um, I guess, uh, no, yeah. again, I'm sorry, um, sorry, only because it sounds like we're, we're from, we're singing from the same hymn sheet. And again, I fully agree for, I've had the same, the, literally two examples, exactly the same where um, after announcing uh, P expectations, school policies around changing um, the curriculum, I then had a student who, um, who came with a similar scenario where I would like to do, you do X option in this class. Uh, and of course, I was more than happy to accommodate, despite it not necessarily fitting in with what, you know, the groups I wanted people in. It was absolutely fine and, and, work, and not a problem and continue to accommodate. But I, I just think, and this is me being maybe um, critical of myself and our approach, when not necessarily, when P isn't necessarily becoming uh, a... Tr a scene for a transgender lens then we're just simply waiting for that student to have the anxiety moment but then seek support and seek an, another option for us we're not like if that's essentially what i'm saying i'm i'm waiting for a student who may have that um sort of issue or uh, dilemma mm -hmm. seek support from me and i offer the solution but i wouldn't necessarily say that's that's teaching p for a transgender lens per se that's just adapting or sorry reacting yeah so i guess if you if you're do you have boys and girls groups uh so we've got uh, a boys group a girls group and a mixed group in every every um side or year group 
So boys, girls are mixed. Right. So there is an opportunity for, for do, do they get to choose if they go boys, girls or mixed? Or is that something you do? So it will be like, uh, as brutally honest, it'll be preset based on if we go with so the terms we used earlier, based on the the predetermined sex at their birth. So we'd go with that, whatever's on Sims, M or yeah. F. Yeah. Um, we'd go with that. Um, and then essentially it either works for everyone. And if it doesn't, we have that conversation and allow them the option. Mm. Um, the, the primary reason for this, I actually implemented this this year. The reason was for the past four years where we've always had mixed groups and um, it was based on sets and ability, physical ability. And as you, as you mentioned, the issues with that, I wanted to get rid of it completely. But the problem I had was students were complaining through student voice. They said that, so for example, girls said, I don't like working with that boy or these boys because X, Y, and Z. Boys had similar arguments about girls. Um, there wasn't an argument for transgender at the time. So that's why we moved towards boys, girls, and then a mixed group. Mm. And again, yes, they would fully have the option of where they go. But I, I, again, I don't believe that's a transgender lens view because I've not stated at the start, right, everyone stand up, whatever you identify as, you get to pick what group you're in at the start <laughs> of the year. I, it was predetermined. So that's just, yeah. again, I'm being, I'm being I feel like crit critical of myself. Sure if I, I could right. jump in there, um, first of all, I think it's it's a really, really cool reflection in this notion of reacting versus um, being proactive and, and structuring our space so that it's, as Simon said earlier, welcoming and safe. And that I think that's the, the questions that, if I'm right, Simon, we're going to look at next week. How can we... Um, I think Simon's going to finish this session with some questions to consider for next week, which is um, uh, around that. But uh, I, I think there's a, there's a bigger conversation around safety when you um, reflect and report um, boys or girls coming to you saying, "I'm not, I don't like working with those people specifically because of their gender identity uh, or their gender manifestation." boys not like working with girls and so to pick up on the question you raised how do you and it, don't get me wrong there's no quick solution or easy answer for this but how do you um create uh, a, a very safe welcoming and inclusive space in in pe with the messaging around uh well the the, the marks that those sort of conversations are not welcomed and acceptable um in itself in an inclusive way by having having those conversations and doing that work so lots of really really good stuff i'm really wary of the time jessica has stayed on throughout and we appreciate that we she flagged up that she has class so um very very quickly i put in the chat that changing rooms must be a problematic space for transgender young people uh, any any other triggers going back to Simon's slide? Kit, I suppose. Re kit requirements. Anything else? Yeah, I guess so. Again, a, a potential solution. Um, we are we do have we have a boys and a girls kit, but from the get go, we've always offered uh, and always stated clearly, verbally and through home letters, that a student may wear whatever kit they wear so we have um, a polo so like a collared polo top uh typical uh sp sports football type shorts and long socks uh, we also on the other hand have a more a, a, a top which doesn't have a collar and then leggings but again i think preempting some of the the anxieties and the confusion we've always said you may wear ex exactly what you feel comfortable in so long as it has the school logo um we, we don't have like skirts or anything like that as an option. I know some, some schools have netball where there's a skirt short type thing, but yeah, we've, it could be a trigger, but we've always said wear what you want, what you're happy with and comfortable with. So that might be a solution. Like it sounds like you're doing a lot of good work at your school. And I think, I think you might be falling into the trap of being hypercritical of yourself. Cause I think with regards to the through the lens, it's not, I think it's more about if a child can come to pee feeling safe, 
um, and valued, you've done your job. And if you have an opportunity to either be in a single gender class or a mixed gender class, that that is enough to relieve that pressure of, I don't want to be in this boys group or this girls group. It becomes a non-issue. Um, we have that option at Key Stage 4 in Year 10, Year 11. And I, of the, the class I taught today, probably a quarter of the students identify as LGBT. I have uh, maybe four or five that are um, trans, with a few of them that are non-binary and two that are um, identifying uh, with, with poor, full parent support. Um, but the fact they're just in a group with some students that, you know, a lot of students that aren't LGBT, that just want to be in a, a group because they prefer being physically active with boys and girls, it is a non-issue. We don't ever make reference to it, but it's just, we've just provided that opportunity where they don't have to be set by their gender um, and that create a, create a problem. So I think, I think you're doing better than you think you ought to be doing. Um, and like you said, with the, with the kit, even if you offer, um, by, by saying anyone can wear anything within the, the boundaries, I, I wonder if your school uniform is the same, whether girls can wear trousers, black, like trousers and not have to wear a skirt, don't know. Um, but no, that's a good point. Nope, uh, it's very clear where the skirt is worn and where the trousers are worn. So that's a good point. That might be worth the conversation with your line manager or or some from SLT around because yeah, because that could be a trigger just coming to school having to wear um, a particular uniform, which essentially then defines your gender doesn't it? Having to wear something specific. Um, Greg, just quickly about the, the changing rooms. It doesn't have, to, like we, we've got a number of students that are happy to, to be within, say for example, the boys changing room within a cubicle. Um, we started off thinking that we had to provide a completely separate space for trans students, but actually there's some students that are happy to be in a changing room, just need that little bit of extra privacy within the changing room. So we've put up cubicles within a larger, larger room, uh, which has proven to be um, really positive for a lot of a lot of students. I would I would just challenge with that as well because this has been my we, we have students this is non gender related but we have so many students quite a lot post COVID who don't feel comfortable in a large room around people. I mean I don't think many adults would either. So we've had to accommodate. My solution initially was either use the space behind the shower curtain or the cubicle, and then a, one of the TAs actually challenged that and said actually. Um, there's another sort of shower room space where we will supervise um, and that just gives them a little bit more decency and I, I thought about it and I thought well I'm not I didn't think it was uh, like indecent of us to offer that cubicle but when you think about it being in a cubicle by the toilet locked away um, although it may fit for that student if there's a way you can get a member of staff to supervise a more decent area or space I think that's probably the, the, the gold standard but yeah we're, we're on the same page it sounds so big up to uh, Crispin. Thanks. Uh, we have we have very old buildings here as well. We're looking to, to build a new um, changing room block. Um, so I've got that the exciting prospect of designing one bespoke from, from the start. Um, but I know schools that don't supervise their changing rooms at all. They have a corridor, they, it's a leisure centre in the evening, we have small changing rooms off each side. Students change unsupervised every day and that, that's a, a safeguarding concern, I think. But um, is, yeah, and, and this is maybe just a U.S. perspective. Is is it an option to not even change out? Good question. No. Um, although it, it was okay in a pandemic, um, and students could come, we had the highest number of engagement in, in during the pandemic with students coming in their PE kit to school. So they would just arrive in their PE kit, do PE, and as is, Zach is said. That a, it's a governmental mandate, or this the school says you need to change. That um, good question, Greg. You know I, that's just something we've always done, and therefore we'd always do. Um, yeah, I think the more we look at practice in, uh, I think it's fair to say the UK, um, uh, the the more archaic it is and out of kilter. Um, I did a, a lot of work in India. Uh, the kids didn't change and they were 
taking part in activities. It was 37, 38 degrees. Um, and that was logistics, time wasting, um, this number of students in the school. Um, I don't think they change in Europe. Um, do, do they typically not change in the US then? They just take part in... Well, I, I've done lots of workshops and they will, teachers will grade them on their ability to change clothes and then they kids refuse to change so then they fail them and then they wonder why they have huge class sizes and so, so they are they're refusing to change. change well no like jordan doesn't um the high school i was at yesterday doesn't um not even i think they have an option they can if they want to the teacher provides them like two or three minutes and they can go change if they want to but they don't have to and usually there's some kind of activity going out in the gym space while they're changing. So I, I don't think there was a single one that did. Um, so I'm just thinking of ways to eliminate potential sources of anxiety or sort of I mean, any. That, yeah, eh, I think, just... yeah, I think, you know, it's easy on the call like this to say, oh, you know, that's what, why don't we just do that? In in some schools, this, this well, in a lot of schools, in my experience, this is a really big deal. Like it would right. be, you know, oh, it, it's it would be sacrilegious for the kids to right. not get changed. Part of the routine, etc. Um, I, I, as I say, for many years, I've, I've wondered why. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, great, um, Simon. Where where do we want people to go before next week? Let me have a little look, a little, little play of the slides, just to put one or two up there to have a little think about uh, for next week. Just on the back of that, Greg, today we had about 200 students on an AstroTurf, kicking footballs around, running around, playing, all in their uniform. Um, they come to PE next lesson, we must make sure they get changed into their PE kit because it's unhygienic to exercise and clothes you're going to wear for the rest of the day. And, you know, when we do things like table tennis on the curriculum, and I, I think there's a risk of, if you create grey areas around, you don't have to get changed for one activity, but you do for others. Um, having to take jewellery out, you know, it's obvious for contact sports like rugby, less obvious for table tennis. Um, but, you know, anyway, debate for another day, I guess. So um, if I just move on. So the one of the questions I was going to pose, um, just move that out of my way for a second, bear with me. Uh, what, what might we, the peer profession, be inadvertently getting wrong? Um, issues around curriculum, the language we use, changing facilities, extracurricular opportunities, uh, reinforcing stereotypes, um, and invisibility of us being um, allies and supportive of, of um, the LGBT community. Um, and we could probably have a little look at the traps that we've been falling in. And no doubt I, I still fall into, and looking back at my practice of five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I've certainly done a lot over my time that I would not do um, again now knowing what I do um, and I think if I just just jump forward a few slides um, bear with me so what could what could you do to make um, trans students feel more safe and valued in your school um, and I was looking at things that we could do individually us as teachers or as departments us as a department and us as a school um, and Zach has already pointed out that there's whole school policy could be something that could be addressed. Um, a school local to me that I don't teach at, but in the town where I live, um, a year 11 student challenged the head teacher on the, um, behave, on the uniform policy and the policy was changed to a gender neutral, uh, allowing girls and boys to wear whatever they wanted. So the boys can wear skirts if they want, the girls can wear um, trousers if they want. Um, and the main barriers to achieving meaningful change um, would be the, the, the two I guess we'd look at. So, Zaki might the main barrier might be if there's not SLT support for changing the traditional um, uniform policy, um, that could be a barrier there. So, the main barriers to achieving meaningful change and what we could do um, to adapt our practice um, on a personal department and school level. As a, as a setup for, for next time, Greg, any thoughts? Thanks, thanks so much, Simon, and thanks everyone who's watched this live or watched it on the recording. 
Um, if you are watching it on the recording, um, feel free to send in comments um, uh, ready for next week's conversation, which will be much more open, if I got that right, Simon, and much more, much more interactive and discursive. Um, so yeah, we, we're slightly over time. Um, so thank you very much and thank you, uh, Simon, much, much appreciated. You're welcome, Greg. And if there's anything that's come up that you haven't had a chance to, to raise or it comes up retrospectively, do feel free to drop Greg an email uh, who can forward on any questions or if, if there's anything specific you want next week to, to make sure we do discuss, then, then please do. Yeah.